Why? What? Too much exposure for you? Well, excuse me. The shutter is... Cameras need... There's no such thing as infinity in the physical world. Just as the tallest mountain has a peak, a snapshot of the tiniest moment is actually a record of a period of time. In cameras, we call the setting that controls that period shutter speed. Why? As usual, because of olden times. The earliest cameras were just a box. You uncovered a lens, let light accumulate inside for a tedious amount of time, then covered the lens back up. This made selfies extremely challenging. As the photosensitivity of the medium inside the box increased, exposure times decreased. Things got less motion blurry, but it became important to get the short timing of the exposure just right. Jobs of hardworking lens uncoverers were lost to cheap, newfangled mechanisms, such as guillotine shutters, leaf shutters, and Packard shutters. The best designs made sure to close in the opposite pattern of how they opened, so that every particle on the film plane spent exactly the same amount of time in the light. But nothing could have prepared the industry for the disruptive technology of motion pictures. The rigorous demands of taking upwards of 16 photographic images per second were beyond the capabilities of traditional shutter designs. Luckily, there was a simple solution. Convert spinny motion into intermittent motion. The standard in pretty much all movie cameras from the time of Lumiere Brothers to the century in which I began to be alive has been the rotary shutter, a disc with a wedge cut out that spins at a constant rate between the lens and the gate that lets light in. Of course, in practice, it's actually much cooler. The wedges are doubled so the disc can spin half as fast, and it's angled 45 degrees and has a mirror surface so that between exposures, light is bounced to a viewfinder so you can see what the hell you're filming. You might ask, Captain, you're very smart, but if we're now capturing continuous motion, why do we need a shutter at all? Well, because it's still the past. We're still burning discrete picture rectangles onto a film strip, and the camera needs time in the dark for a scary claw to advance it to the next picture burning spot, usually about half the time of the whole frame capturing process. So two distinct things, the frame rate, how many pictures are taken per second, and shutter speed, how much of one picture's time slot is spent actually capturing the light, are cleverly mechanically synced up. This is where we get the cinematic concept of shutter angle, measuring exposure relative to the life of a movie frame, as opposed to the primitive still photography idea of shutter speed measured in fractions of a second. You just have to get used to conceptualizing slices of a hypothetical pie as a percentage of an arbitrary unit of time. Like a novelty Japanese watch. As movie cameras improved, it was possible to just barely increase the shutter angle to around 200 degrees. Of course, it could always be decreased so you could artistically symbolize the carnage of an ancient Roman battle with sharp staccato frames. But if you wanted to symbolize the delirious aftermath of the ancient Roman battle with blurry, streaky, long exposures, you had to actually lower the frame rate. But honestly, no one wanted to dig into the camera to switch the little disc. You had to tell the rental house in advance 180 degrees was fine. Aside from specialty high-speed cameras that used crazy things like a rotary prism to expose continuously sliding film, exposure time of half the frame rate became the unspoken standard in cinematic art. And since the world agrees that 24 frames per second is the best frame rate, all the most iconic images in our collective movie memories, from Star Wars to Star Wars, are built of 1 48th of a second moments in time held on screen for twice that long. And now it's time to forget all that because the concept of capturing images was completely reimagined in the electronic age. Film was out and the capture medium became tubes, which we don't have time for that. But eventually it became something like film again, an array of photosensitive silicon pixels on a chip. This was the CCD. Now the shutter wasn't a shutter at all, but a decision about how long to let the pixels get bombarded by photons globally all at once before having them pass the loose electrons they collected to each other down the array like a bucket brigade to be transformed into voltage fluctuations that could be read out as a video signal. Unshackled from mechanical parts, electronic shutter speed could now be crazy fast or crazy slow, even the entire duration of a frame. Well, almost. 
This is a DSR 370, the sickest early 2000s broadcast camera a superhero could afford straight out of space college. Look at its adorable little half-inch type CCD. There are actually three of them in there, but don't worry about that. Like all North American cameras of the time, it was hardwired to shoot in standard definition at 29.97 frames or 59.94 interlaced fields per second. The idea of making the shutter even faster than that refresh rate seemed silly most of the time. But if you really wanted to change it to avoid flicker when shooting a CRT monitor or something, there was a physical switch to engage the electronic shutter. Then you could set it in either fractions of a second or more precisely in hertz. Note that the slowest you could set it was 60.4 hertz. It's not true 360 degree shutter because you needed that tiny bit of time to read out all the pixels and reset them for the next exposure. The more pixels there are, the longer that process takes. And that's the problem with CCDs. They weren't scalable enough. When the other spawn of Omega Draconis gifted Earth the corrupting technology of high definition television in early 21st century, humanity suddenly needed a cheaper way to capture much larger images at increasingly obnoxious frame rates. Enter Active Pixel CMOS sensors. In these, each pixel transforms its own loose electrons into a voltage and sends it off a row at a time to the part of the chip where it's converted to a digital signal. This is much more efficient because why should these freed pixels above be idling and taking bathroom breaks when they could already be capturing the next image? As one exposure rolls off the chip, the next can start rolling in. You know, like a sort of, uh, oh no, rolling shutter! We've all seen them. Skewed, wobbly, or completely scrambled images that happen in digital cameras because that CMOS sensor readout sweep means consecutive rows of pixels capture slightly different moments in time. Whether the shutter speed is long or short, the sweep is always the same, and fast-moving objects are bound to be distorted. At first glance, it seems like something you could compensate for in post by shifting the rows back into alignment until you realize the shift varies depending on the speed of the motion. In some cases, you could use sophisticated tracking and remapping, but there's still nothing you can do about that or that. Rolling shutter is unfixable and present in almost all modern footage. Some hate the artifact because it used to not be a thing and now it is. Others don't care because they grew up with it and think this looks fine. And a select few are gradually driven to madness by a simple question. Captain, all mechanical shutters are literally rolling shutters. They all travel across the image, sometimes in exactly the same pattern as an electronic shutter. How come they don't cause the rolling shutter effect? The answer is, they kind of do. Mechanical shutter curtains and CMOS sensor readouts move at a constant rate regardless of the shutter speed setting, and faster speeds are achieved by more closely staggering the mechanisms that start and end exposure, narrowing it to a slit. It's just that in most stills cameras available to most people today, the mechanical shutter fires way faster. So fast, you usually just can't perceive the distortion with the naked eye. Another factor in why even a narrow-angle rotary disc shutter seems to avoid rolling shutter artifacts is a little thing called the lens. It's there to focus light perfectly on the focal plane. But the shutter is way out in front. Here, the light is still unfocused, and any disruptions to it appear diffused. It's the same reason changing the aperture inside the lens doesn't show up as an actual iris in the image, but as an overall change in brightness. Of course, it's a matter of proportion. In very old, large format cameras where a giant shutter was near a giant glass plate and moved relatively slowly, it actually did cause a funny kind of rolling shutter. Some even say it's where we got the classic concept of cartoon speed distortion. But even for modern stills photographers with their lightning fast focal plane shutter DSLRs, the physical position of the tiny curtain makes a difference. It's funny, some cameras do this hybrid thing called electronic first curtain shutter, where the exposure is started by the sensor, then the mechanical shutter closes to end it, and the optical discrepancy between the two has a weird effect on bokeh, okay. the blobby bright spots in out of focus areas that photographers are obsessed with, and it's hilarious to see them cry about it. Oh, my bokeh, my precious bokeh, look what's happened to it, oh no! <laughs> 
Despite what experts on Reddit say, it seems like in general people are bothered by rolling shutter defects. Consumers comment on it whenever they see it, folksy educators make videos about it, VFX artists hate how it makes tracking and compositing less accurate. And yet we're forced to just accept it. I'm not saying it's a conspiracy, I'm just saying the CMOS sensor was initially commercialized by a guy from NASA JPL who started a company that got bought by another company, renamed, then sold to a semiconductor giant which itself rebranded and now supplies sensors to the most popular line of professional cinema cameras in the world which all have rolling shutter! To be fair, they did try a mechanical shutter version but it didn't catch on. And to be even more fair, not all rolling shutter is created equal. The actual readout speed of different sensors varies a lot. Nerds who test new cameras have ways of measuring it in milliseconds. And while in some cameras it spans almost the duration of a frame, a few of the best ones have rolling shutter so minimal it rivals mechanical shutter. But it's perfectly possible to expose the whole frame at once to have global shutter in a CMOS sensor. Every pixel just needs its own capacitor to store the exposure until it can be read out. That makes it more expensive, but as manufacturing processes improve, it is becoming almost affordable. Before you know it, global shutter cameras will be in phones, and we might finally get back to the integrity of images we had in the early 1900s. Imagine. Global adoption of global shutter. Although, most people don't care, so there's not a ton of incentive for it. There's not a ton of incentives for anything anymore. Ever feel that? It's like we finished a video game and now it's the end credits, but we keep mashing the controller like it does something. It's the credits, man. It's the part in the Sonic 2 credits medley where the drums go 